Okay, good morning everybody, we'll get started. My name is Troy Swanson, I'm the library department chair. I'd like to welcome you all to the library. It's good to see so many of you this early in the morning and thank you, um, I see some uh, staff and faculty here. So also thanks for taking time out of your day to be here. This is our second event in our graphic novel symposium each year. This is our fourth symposium actually where we try to celebrate pop culture but also emphasize the ways that ideas that exist maybe in academia um, translate into pop culture and how this communication happens. And of course, we're also comic book nerds, so we just like to celebrate comics and things like that. Um, and it is, it, we, we would not be doing it right if we didn't have Dan Doherty join us today. <laughs> um, Dan is an award-winning um, comics creator, writer, artist, illustrator. Um, he lives just down the street from Moraine Valley, and he actually uh, is, uh, is an alum of, our, of Moraine. He went on from here to UIC, yes, <laughs> yep, round Thank of applause. You. <laughs> um, <laughs> he went on to get his bachelor's yeah. degree in fine arts at UIC. Um, I love his work, and I was just talking to him about you know reading his issues. I keep up with his Touching Evil series. Um, it's really fantastic. He has a table right outside the library um, where he will be selling books and signing. And so please, um, you know, stop by, say hi, um, buy some stuff. I do want to get do a quick thank you to Espresso Love, our coffee bar. They support our symposium, so you know when you're done here, go buy coffee and um, be nice to them. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dan. Thanks, Dan, for being here. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, everybody. All right. All right. Uh, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Dan. Um, I'm I'm really honored to be here today. Uh, last year, you guys had Gene Ha, which is one of my uh, heroes and and I'd like to say friend. Um, and uh, so it's it's really cool to be able to follow him. Um, it's also really cool to be back here. Uh, I, I went here from 98 to uh, early 2000, um, and a lot has changed, and some things have stayed the same, but uh, it was a really good experience for me. Um, and it definitely was where I started thinking that it was possible that I could have a career in, in art in some capacity. Like, I, I came out of high school, um, and actually got a uh, scholarship from this school, uh, which was amazing to me. Like I, it, it was really validating um, for uh, the art show that you guys have here, the, uh, the one that collects all the, the local high schools. And, um, and they present like one or two awards, I think. And so I got one of those. Um, and I went from thinking, am I going to go to college to I'm going to go to Moraine. This is great. Um, and so. Uh, you know, I, I started here, and I, I, I got to test out a lot of different um, mediums and a lot of different um, ideas and concepts about art and find out what I liked and didn't like. Um, and when my time here was up, I, I uh, completed my, my uh, bachelor's at uh, UIC. But I really feel like it was great that I, I got a chance to start here. Um, I know it's a shameless uh, promotion of the school, but it's, it's cool. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I, I still came out of college um, a, a bit confused uh, and, and not sure of where to go next. Uh, they don't really, you know, hand you a, a, a map with art. It doesn't. There really is no one way to do it. Um, and I think that's kind of the good and bad part about it. Is it's it's wonderful if you um, if you have that that uh, that drive and ambition, you can find your way in in some path. But it's also a bit strange sometimes when you don't know exactly where to go or you don't have somebody to give you advice and, and whatnot. So I stumbled a bit uh, uh, coming out um, just trying to find some, some work. Uh, and so I'm going to take you guys through a bunch of different things throughout my, um, let's see what that be, like uh, 14 years of, of working in comics uh, professionally. And um, I'm skipping a couple things just because I couldn't even find some of the things that I've done. Uh, I've probably illustrated about uh, somewhere around like five dozen published books at this point. Um, some of them are small, some of them are big, some of them were with companies that you would recognize, some of them, you know, tanked right away. <laughs> so there's been a lot of, you know, little uh, hiccups and, and triumphs along the way. Uh, but I'll try to hit the, the bigger stuff. Um, let me see if I can work this right. Okay. So, um, this is my comic Beardo, um, and this is actually one of the first strips. I actually I had redrawn it. I couldn't find the original version of it, but I had redrawn it um, because of of how sketchy it was when I first did it. When I first got out of college, uh, I was struggling to find work as a freelance artist, and uh, I had very little to my name in terms of both money and resume. So um, I needed insurance. I needed money. I started working at Starbucks. <laughs> 
And, uh, and I, as much as I appreciate that experience now, I hated it at the time. I was like, I, I want to just be doing what I'm good at, and I want, um, I want it all now, like now, now, now. Um, so I'd come home very frustrated after like an eight-hour shift dealing with the public and smelling like coffee, and I would have just about enough energy in me uh, between that and any other things that I was doing to knock out a quick comic strip um, every day. Uh, it was always very sketchy at first. It was something that was like I would do in maybe a half an hour and, and be done with it. But uh, what I would do with it was, and this will really date me, um, post it on MySpace. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Uh, MySpace was the thing. The year was 2000, whatever. Uh, and uh, I would post it on there. Um, this, by the way, I, I should mention, I had put out one book prior to this that was a huge accomplishment for me, but didn't sell at all. Like it, I sold maybe like 100 copies of it. It was this big graphic novel. It was my, my college project. I put that out. I thought, I'm, I've arrived. This will be amazing. And that didn't go anywhere. So Starbucks was my next option. Um, and I put these strips out um, just thinking I was going to connect with people and try to like maybe rediscover what what was uh, interesting to me about comics, like kind of get back to basics. I was always somebody who really liked the uh, the comics of the newspapers of the 80s. I was like a Calvin and Hobbes guy, uh, Bloom County, uh, Dilbert, uh, pretty much anything that existed in the 80s of, of you know, which was my childhood was uh, was like up here for me. So. Beardo became my attempt to do that stuff. Um, and uh, I started making these strips. And after about 25 or 30 of them, um, and a, f a pretty regular pace of, of putting them out, I started getting people going like, you should do this more. Like, this is pretty funny. Like, it, it was relatable to a lot of my, my people at that time. We were all working retail, or we were all starting off doing something to pay the bills while we were trying to do what we want to do. And, um, and so, as, as uh, luck would have it, uh, a newspaper picked it up, uh, the Daily Illini in, um, in uh, Champaign-Urbana. It's a, it's a college paper, I don't know if you've ever been down there, but they were willing to pay me to make this comic. And I was like, yes, let's do this. Uh, and so all of a sudden, I had to think of five ideas a week and come up with uh, five strips a week, uh, five dailies. And um, eventually, I started doing Sundays as well. So pretty soon, I went from having this little thing that was like a way to vent about my day, um, and usually it was just at the expense of customers or whoever. Like I was, as long as I didn't mention anyone by name, I felt okay with it. Uh, so I would I would vent about my day, and then all of a sudden it turned into a job. It was kind of like, oh, that's that's pretty cool. The power of comics to to actually make you know your your uh, trivial little problems into um, a story to share with people. Um, so I kept doing it, and eventually I had about 300 and something strips, which I thought was enough to collect into a book, which ended up being the, uh, the green book there, the, the art degree guarantee, which um, the guarantee being that you can work at Starbucks. Um, yeah, I, I had a pretty bitter sense of humor at the time. <laughs> I, was, I was very, uh, I was very uh, jaded about some things, but I was still like trying to keep pushing and, and push through that because I knew that I was just kind of being a little little dramatic about it. Um, so, you know, I, ma I made more of these. And as I made more of the strip, I got into, um, I, got, I got a little bit more notorious with, with that particular series. The first book um, actually did do pretty well. Like, I was self-publishing all of this, but I was selling through what I was uh, printing on demand. And uh, it attracted the attention of the Southtown, which was about a year or so after I started doing it. So. Uh, soon I had two papers that were paying me to do it. And, and it was in a time that newspapers were already kind of failing, or at least they were, they were diminishing in terms of what they were willing to um, take on in, in terms of new content. So for me, that was like a huge, like, I can't believe I got into a paper when I just saw that they cut like another three or four comics. Like, in fact, my, my funny story about um, when I first started at the Southtown was that I had replaced Gasoline Alley. And um, I like Gasoline Alley. It was, it's one of the few comics that actually ages its characters through the series. A lot of them just, you know, like Peanuts, those kids are always going to be kids, and Calvin's never going to not have his imaginary stuffed tiger, but Gasoline Alley kept going. And um, so <laughs> when they opened up the comments section or the, 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 uh, the feedback section for the, um, 
the readers to, to talk about the strip, some guy said that um, because I had replaced Gasoline Alley, which was so dear to him, that it was like I had murdered his family. <laughs> That's a quote. Yeah, and I'm like, like I had murdered his family. I'm like, geez, man, I'm sorry. Like, I, I didn't tell them cut Gasoline Alley. I just said, I'll take a job. Like, but it was kind of cool, too, because it showed how much people cared about that section um, and that, uh, that I at least had an audience, even if they didn't always like what I was doing. Um, so I did that along with making more books um, and then starting to put it online at, uh, at Go Comics, which is a, uh, the largest online site for comic strips. Um, they do everything from modern to classic uh, comics, meaning that they can do stuff that's as old as like, you know, Gasoline Alley or uh, Calvin and Hobbes or, or Dilbert or whatever, and they can do stuff that's brand new stuff that, you know, is introducing those old generations to new comics and new ideas. Um, you know, they've got some really fun stuff that's quirky. They've got like political stuff. My, my buddy Mike Norton's uh, comic just got on there, Little Donnie. Um, He's very uh, opinionated about the president. Um, but uh, it's a really nice array of stuff that's up there. Um, and, uh, and so I, I got to be a part of that, and it's, it, I still am a part of that. Um, Beardo's been running since 2006, and I believe it was running since 2008 on Go Comics. So I started evolving with the strip. Like, uh, I started doing stuff that was, um, you know, about life as it was happening. Like, I, I got out of Starbucks. I, I um, got engaged, I got married, I, I have kids now, like, and I kept chronicling my life through it. So, so Beardo kept growing through the course of the books, and you can actually kind of see the timeline, if you look at it, of me going from slinging coffee to um, getting engaged, getting married, uh, striking it out on my own as a, as a freelance artist officially with no other jobs, um, and then having my, uh, at least my first kid <laughs> is, is in the book. My second kid's going to be probably mad because they're they're left out. But <laughs> I just had a, I just had a boy last week, so it's it's very new. Like I, I had a, a son on my birthday uh, last Thursday. Um, thank you. Yeah, the biggest accomplishment of the of the presentation. <laughs> so uh, I'm very tired, by the way, um, but I'm I'm happy to be here. Uh, so yeah, so the series I, I kept having to write about life. It was actually really uh, cathartic and um, a way to. Um, not take myself so seriously and, and kind of be uh, able to address my problems and then move on from them because I, I felt like if I could consolidate something that was uh, annoying me or bothering me or whatever it was into a strip, then it was out of my life. It was, it was something I could just go, okay, moving on. That's, that's funny. Someone else can experience that. Great. Let's keep going. Um, like here's my, this is actually the first time that my strip uh, went viral, uh, which by this time was was like more like Facebook and Reddit and all that stuff. So this strip, I didn't know it was going to be striking a chord with a lot of people, but it did, and um, was just about how frustrating it is sometimes to to run your own business. Like I'm I'm a guy who's pretty much a sole proprietor. I, I have people that I hire to to help with some of my um, my projects as I've grown, but for the most part. Uh, ever since I, I left Starbucks in 2008, um, I've been steadily kind of trying to build my business, which has been mostly a, a solitary endeavor. Um, and it comes with a lot of these things. Like, uh, I, I think, actually, Gene said it best in a, a, a presentation I had last year when he came to my, my school. Um, he said that I got married so I would have a friend to talk to around the house. <laughs> And I was like, that's kind of true. Like, it, you, when you start doing uh, these creative uh, things and, and you start working for yourself, like, you find that you spend a lot of your time, I wouldn't say, like, in isolation, but definitely, like, kind of focused on one thing. And you have to, like, carve out some time in the day to go out and do something else. So um, a lot of these were coming from a place that, you know, was, was very frustrating to me. I was like, man, I, where are my friends going? And I, I can't keep up with, with modern culture. And... Uh, I can't hang out, and, and I have blah, blah, blah. So I put it out there, and it really struck a chord with a lot of people and kind of uh, brought the this trip to a whole new level for me. That was around book three. Um, and at the same time around book three, I started doing, um, I started learning how to crowdfund, which is something I'm going to talk about a couple times in, in my little presentation here. 
Um, this was the first time I tried to do anything that was like, hey, I need to raise money for something. Um, and the, the thing that I was raising money for was book three. This actually was the original cover for it. Um, when I got to book four, I rebranded the whole series and I, I kind of touched up some old things and I put new covers on everything. But at the time, this was my most ambitious cover um, for the series. And what I did was um, I put it out there on my social media and on my mailing list that I was going to sell the space at the bottom to people who wanted to be on my cover. And they would pay, I think, I forget what I charged them or something. It wasn't much. It was like maybe like 50 or 75 bucks or something like that. And you could be drawn into the, the cover of the book and then all of that covered my, my printing expenses for that book. So when I pitched it to everybody, it was this. It was this very raw sketch, and I was like, this could be you, all these little, these little guys down here. Um, and uh, and it, it's, it got scooped up like in a, less than a day. Like everyone uh, just nabbed it. And in fact, I think I had to add a couple more spaces. Um, so this was the actual, this is a, a scan of just the, the art without the coloring. So I think I had about like 20 something, maybe almost close to 30 people that just jumped in there. And it was a small victory, but it was a victory for me. It was like kind of cool that I could, you know, pretty much finance what I needed to do without, um, without having to pull any money out of my own pocket because I was already, you know, putting a lot into this. Uh, every one of those books is like about 150 pages. It's about 300 strips. So it usually takes me about a year and a half to two years to make one of those in between other projects. Um, so the fact that this happened so quickly was really encouraging, and I believe it was before Kickstarter became like a real thing. Like it was, it was uh, something that I felt like really cool about. And then when I saw the Kickstarter and, and um, Indiegogo and all those those platforms started growing, I'm like, oh, this is this is even better. Um, so I'll keep going here. Uh, what I also learned as I was um, kind of growing as an artist is that um, that I needed to also manage myself as a uh, per, like a uh, brand out there in the world. Like I needed to connect with my audience and I needed to start um, just getting out into new markets. Like I felt like when I was looking at all the people who were my fans or friends or whoever that were supporting me that they were either people that I knew personally or lived in the tri-state area. Like they were, they were Chicagoans mostly or you know maybe Michigan and Indiana was about as far as I was going to go. So um, Probably since I'd say like 07 or 08, I started seriously uh, hitting comic conventions. Um, and I started out with just a couple books and, um, and some prints and whatnot. And I, I gradually uh, pushed my, my, um, my product and my, my presence up to usually having to have about two tables and somewhere in the realm of like a dozen books, uh, prints, um, all kinds of stuff that, that uh, I grew and learned with as I did all these shows. Um, the most shows I had done in a year, uh, so far I think my record is like 28, I think, in a year. Um, and I'll hit like, you know, San Diego Comic Con, New York Comic Con, uh, Emerald City, uh, all the big ones, and then a lot of the wizard shows. Um, that's a whole circuit in, unto itself. And then smaller uh, events, like anything from like college appearances like this, or, um, uh, little one-day or two-day shows that are kind of in the area um, of, of my ability to drive to them. So I realized that this was actually kind of a great way for me at least to not only connect with my audience but to have some supplemental income to put back in the books and to build my fan base and, and, and grow, um, which I've seen those results. It also was a fun way to um, uh, earn a different kind of uh, money, which is uh, commissions. I, I, I wanted to uh, show some, some fun commissions I've done um, and what's fun is that people challenge me to like do things all the time that are like radically different. Some of them are a little bit more straightforward like this. Um, this was just a, uh, an ink uh, drawing that was done with brushes. Um, but it's become part of my, <laughs> some of my favorite ones actually. <laughs> Uh, it's become part of my, my income on the road is like you, you kind of set up a, a commission list and people fill it pretty quickly after a certain point in your career and you know that, okay, hey, I'm going to get like X amount of money and X amount of challenges to, to draw different things um, that are fun. Like here's a, this was a Doctor Strange and Silver Surfer jazz performance. People ask for some weird stuff. 
I didn't come up with it. I just was like, oh, sure, whatever you want, man. I'll, I'll draw it. Um, and uh, this was all done in, um, in quills and ink. Uh, and the last one was done with Copic markers and, and uh, technical pens. Um, I usually work on Bristol when I go out because it's easy. And uh, otherwise, I might work with some sort of watercolor paper or a printmaking paper if I'm doing any ink washes for my art people here. By the way, do I have people who are like art students? Do I have art students here? I have one art student. <laughs> Sorry to isolate you or, or make you stand out there. Um, this was a swamp thing that I did um, that was all, I believe, quills and brushes. But then I actually hired somebody to color it for me because I just really like their, their coloring work. And she did not disappoint. Um, this is a fun Bugs Bunny Deadpool that somebody wanted. Um, I don't know why it's one of my favorite things. <laughs> it's really, it, I'm not even really a big Deadpool guy, but I really like this, this Bugs Deadpool. Um, uh, a Daenerys and Drogon uh, ink one. And this is an ink wash piece, so it's, it's all just ink and water and, and brushes. Um, that was a really fun one. And I had a bunch of people who uh, were just kind of following me on, on my social media going like, hey, you've been talking about Game of Thrones so much. You should draw some Game of Thrones. And I'm like, I should. So I did a few of them. This was, this was just my favorite one. Um, so while I was doing Beardo and through pretty much the entire time of my career, I've, I've jumped onto a, a bunch of different projects. Um, this is probably one of my favorite ones, even though I think it's sold out now. It's out of print. And I haven't been able to get in touch with the publisher enough to get more of them. Uh, but this was a really fun book to illustrate. It was about a plumber who fights monsters. He, uh, he has a big wrench. He doesn't say anything. He's very like, think like, uh, like Buster Keaton meets James Gandolfini. Like he, he has like a lot of physicality to him. He doesn't talk a lot. And he's got this big presence about him. Um, but he's this monster fighter. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about like some process stuff. So this is what's called like a thumbnail of, of something. Um, this is, in fact, the cover, obviously. So this is one of like maybe about a dozen thumbnails that I had to do for the cover before we landed on an idea that we liked. And usually those thumbnails are very quick and, and down and dirty. They're not um, meant to be refined at all because you're just trying to get those broad strokes of what you're trying to do on the cover, what the placement's going to look like. Um, and you're probably dealing with at least a few opinions. So um, you don't want to spend a whole lot of time on them because those opinions you know, bounce back and forth all the time. And you don't really don't want to waste your time on a piece that one person shoots down. You know, um, So this was probably one of the better ones. And it was at least closer to what we thought would be the final version of it. And then from there, I penciled it. This is my pencils for that, that cover. Um, and I think I have, oh, this, is, this is actually just some pages from it. So this is, a, I, I think I put a couple um, two-page spreads in there. The, the writer was was a, a, a fun person to work with because he would let me kind of blow up certain pages and, and let them breathe. Um, and he wrote me a lot of big things to draw. Like he wrote me several double page spreads that we ended up using um, uh, throughout the course of the series as a, like a recurring theme. But here's Bob surrounded by a bunch of monsters as he was trying to just fix a, a toilet. Um, <laughs> and uh, here he is fighting a bunch of um, other monsters, while he's at a dance club, he, um, he loses that fight, but he goes down swinging. It's pretty good. Uh, this is him fighting a more monsters. <laughs> I really like doing this one. This was actually really hard. These are all done in, um, in ink, as, as well as the, the, some of the commissions I was talking about. It's all ink washes. I tend to work on pretty large paper when I do uh, more detailed work, because it's, I find it's actually easier. Um, the smaller the paper, sometimes it's, um, it's hard to get those, those finer details that I want because you just have to you know, shrink everything down to, to fit that. So um, this was all done with ink washes and quills and I think some technical pens as well. Um, I, use, I use either uh, Copics or, or Micron technical pens depending on what I have available. Um, this was actually, these are the pencils from that. So you can see the scale of this. Actually, each one of those scans, all four of them, I believe is from an 11 by 17 scanner. So it's four times the size of that, meaning it's what, like uh, 22 by uh, something, <laughs> 34. I just had a baby leave me alone. Um, <laughs> uh, this is one of my favorite pages from it. Um, and 
it's not an action page. It's not, nothing crazy's happening. He's just washing a window. But um, for some reason, I got really attached to this page, and I, I spent a lot of time on my ink washes with it. Like, I didn't do any touch-ups to it after. A lot of times when I, I do my ink work, I, um, I kind of allow for, like, certain light uh, effects to be done in post, uh, some of the glowing effects that I'll, I'll do or some of the shadow work. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll uh, kind of enrich in some of the blacks or I'll throw that glow on there in Photoshop or whatever I'm using. But this page is pretty much exactly what I drew. I mean, it's, it's um, even down to the, the silhouette or the, uh, the reflection part, which I also usually would be an overlay thing for me. I would draw it separately and then overlay it on top of what it's supposed to reflect off of. But um, I had a good time with this one. Like, I, I, I think I just took my time on this and did it uh, as best I could, and it somehow all worked out for me. But it's always been one that, um, like when the publisher saw it, that's what actually they were like, yeah, we're going to hire you to do more stuff. It's like this, is, this was one of their favorite pages too. And um, it's always been kind of a hit when I, when I, on a rare occasion that I actually show my work out in public. Here's the, um, the pencils from it too, which were okay. Like they, were, they weren't particularly uh, detailed, um, at least in terms of what the final result was. Um, you can tell that I, I changed a lot of stuff as I inked it. Let's see if I can go back here. Um, yeah. So I added a lot of stuff after the pencils, which I think I just kind of riffed on. But, um, but from that to this was a huge leap. I just had a really good time doing this one. And it was, one again, one of my favorite pages and one that kind of helped the book out a lot. Um, some other projects that I've worked on, I've worked on a lot of kids' books. Um, I've got a few of them up here. This is one that I've got on my table, but I just didn't have space on that one, on this table for it. Um, this is one of my, my other favorite um, kids' books to work on, which totally failed, by the way. It probably like the best production that we ever had. That was beautiful hardcover with a slip, uh, with a um, dust jacket, and um, gorgeous printing, uh, awesome paper. Story was great. I really had a good time drawing it. And we have a hard time selling this one all the time. Like I don't know why it didn't connect with people. But um, I'm still really proud of the work. And it was uh, a collaboration with one of my frequent collaborators and friends, uh, DJ Korchin. He's, a, he's another like award-winning super writer guy. He's, he's really talented. Um, and he's, he reminds me a lot of like a combination of like Shel Silverstein and Tim Burton, this guy. Like he's, he's got like quirky sensibilities, but he knows how to uh, speak to kids and have a good message, uh, like a positive message with them. Um, so we worked on this book. This book is it's called Sam and the Jungle Band, um, and it's about uh, it's about teamwork and diversity. Basically, this this little monkey plays guitar, but he realizes that his audience is only other monkeys, and he's like, I want to play to the whole jungle. So in order to play to the whole jungle, he has to get a band that represents the jungle. So he goes out and finds an elephant who plays drums and a snake who plays bass and so on and so forth. And pretty soon they have the Jungle Band. Um, and so when he told me like how he wanted me to draw this, it was a huge challenge to me because he said he kind of wanted it to look reminiscent of but different from um, like early Disney movies where the, they would paint the backgrounds and the animation cells would not be painted. They would be, you know, they would be more uh, flat colors or, or a limited color palette. And so um, to do this, I drew the whole thing. And I inked all of my line work for my characters, but I painted the background um, with watercolor and gouache. And it was, again, on, on fairly large paper, so I had the opportunity to uh, tweak things and, and fine tune things without being too cramped. Uh, fun fact, I drew myself as an elephant barista on the left side there. <laughs> there, there I, I always, he, he sticks out like a sore thumb to me, but some people don't catch it at first. Once you see it, though, you can't unsee it. it so that's, that's me over there as, as uh, Beardo elephant, um, and then I would so like I would go into Photoshop afterwards with this and touch up some stuff and and color all of my my characters. Um, here's another one where this is actually the full band playing. Uh, I love this one. This is actually one of my my favorite pieces from the from the book. Um, and again, the the process is the same. Um, there's a couple things that I think I did. Really, I mean, really simple stuff. Anyone who knows Photoshop knows that like you can kind of create little glow effects like with the little, the little lightning bugs that are lighting up the stage. Um, but for the most part, the only thing I used Photoshop for was to clean up and then to color the characters. Uh, I had a fun time drawing the little 
um, rainbow smoke that they had too. He, had, he, he came up with a lot of good ideas for me to play with. Um, and this is actually, yes, yeah, so you can see this is the original piece um, without any Photoshop effects and, uh, and all the stuff that was painted versus digitally colored. Um, this is another book that we worked on, and this is actually, I think, yeah, this is a video. Oop, spoke too soon. Let me go back here. So this is a video, um, and let's see if it will play. I don't think I'm going to play all of it, but because it's long, <laughs> but it, uh, I put it in here because it's part of what I do a lot in the last four years or so. Um, I started realizing that a lot of things were going digital and that um, that the technology was finally catching up to um, what I wanted to do with certain things, or at least it was challenging enough for me to go, I got to try this and see if I can come up with something. So um, I bought, a couple years back, I bought an iPad Pro. I, I'd had um, other tablets previously that I could draw from, but they didn't have the same kind of uh, power and, and range as this thing did. So this iPad actually is what I drew this, this uh, a bunch of things on that you're going to see. Um, and I bought an app which is unfortunately named Procreate, but is really good. Uh, I really wish they could have come up with any other name or maybe at least spelled it a little differently, but no, it's Procreate. So, I mean, sometimes my wife will come in and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm procreating, baby. Like, that's all I'm doing. I'm just sitting here and I'm, I'm procreate. <laughs> she's like, this is disgusting, it's terrible. Um, so Procreate is a $6 app, by the way. So you can get it very easily on an iPad or an iPad Pro. Um, and you basically have, I'd say most if not all of the tools that a Photoshop or an equivalent program would have um, just kind of formatted a little bit differently. In fact, I can probably jump out of this at some point and show you a little quick like, tutorial of it if you want to look at that. Um, but what's cool about it is that it also records everything you're doing. So you can create a time lapse video of all the stuff that you're doing as you're doing it. And it really was a game changer for me because I can show that to people now on social media and say like, hey, look at this. This is what I'm up to. Like, um, here's my process. And this is actually, this is one of the more experimental pages from it. This is us trying to figure out, this is a book, by the way, it's right over there, it's a thousand no's. And this was actually really meant to be a very much like a uh, Shel Silverstein, Tim Burton mashup. Like, the, the premise is really wonderful. Um, it's just about a girl who has to deal with rejection. So she's told that her idea is no good. And she's told that over and over again, and pretty soon the no's that she's hearing actually are tangible no's, they're like a physical thing that get inside of her idea and they reshape it and reform it into a better one because it has to learn to grow and expand and, and hear other opinions in order to be better. So um, he's like, yeah, I'm going to have you draw a crazy amount of the word no. Um, so I was drawing no's, as you can see. Like, I think I actually probably drew a thousand no's. Like, there, was, there was just a ton of them because it's, it's not a crazy long book. It's about, I don't know, 40 pages or so, but every page had a a lot of no's and they just kept getting exponentially larger. Um, so I was tasked, tasked with this and um, the iPad helped immensely not only for um, not only for just the purposes of, of having all these different brushes at my disposal to create different textures and whatnot but also that I could erase things very easily uh, if you didn't like them um, because it is a you know collaborative process and sometimes you do 90% of the page and it looks great, but they don't like that one little 10%, and you got to figure out a way to fix that. Um, so the fact that I could just delete something if I didn't like it was amazing, as well as the fact that I could um, record all of this. So I don't know if I'm going to show all of this one, but I will show more of, of another one. Um, we've worked on a couple books together. This is a fun, just a fun image from another one, which we sold out of this book too. This is a book called Thunderfeet, but it was. Um, it's a fun little kid's book about these kids who have imaginary powers um, that they think are real but are not. Uh, and um, we've worked on probably about, I'd say, a dozen books at this point together um, over the last 10 years or so. So um, I'm going to come back to some of that, but I'm going to go to uh, my series, Touching Evil. So as I was doing Beardo um, and a bunch of other projects here and there, uh, I had this story idea that was very much like a um, ripped from like one of my favorite TV shows, uh, The Twilight Zone. Um, so the premise was really simple. It was about this woman who's given this power 
that uh, allows her to kill anyone she touches provided that they're evil. And she has no idea who's evil unless she uses it. Um, so I had this idea and I was telling people about it and they're like, that's really dark, man. Like, <laughs> aren't you the Beardo guy? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I just, I want to make this. And they're like, it's really dark or it's or whatever. They thought it was really creepy and weird and whatever. And they'd se seen that I'd done some other like horror stuff before, but usually I wasn't the writer on it. So um, I'd had this thing percolating in my back of my head and I, I couldn't really let it go. Um, and it ended up becoming one of my most successful books. So I'll, I'll kind of walk you through a couple things from it. Um, this is one of the covers from the series, and that's the main uh, protagonist uh, who has the power. Um, this is the uh, the first page I drew. It's it's her like page it's page two of the series, but it's it's my main character, and um, you can see the pencils versus the uh, the finishes, um, and it was a very scary premise to jump into this. I remember th looking at this page and going like, okay. Like, here we go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this um, and see if people like it. I had a plan to like debut it at C2E2 in that year and see if, if it worked or not. Um, and uh, I, I had some great help. I had great covers from that book from a, a, an artist, uh, Stephen Bryant, and I had um, uh, a friend of mine, Wesley Wong, who's also local, do uh, some inks and, and all of the colors. So um, I kind of dipped my toe into this, this different world and it ended up being a, a pretty big hit for me. Like it was, um, I sold out of it at C2E2. I, um, I did a Kickstarter that was for that hardcover that I'm gonna talk about in a second, but, um, but it was probably the most successful thing I've had going on. And it also changed how people perceived me a little bit, which I thought was, was cool. It's, it's hard to do something for 10 years and then do something else um, and have people say like, oh, aren't you just the guy from that one thing? And um, you're like, yeah, but I, I'm so much more. Like I can, you know, but, but, uh, but the fact that I was lucky enough to get that reception was, was great. Um, so this is a, a two page spread from the series um, where a guy gets kidnapped and, um, and I think I've got, yeah, so here's the pencils from, or some of the inks I should say, the pencils and inks. Um, and I was really kind of finding this new style for myself. Like I'd, I'd done the ink wash work for Bob in the past and I'd done Beardo and people really thought like, like that was about it for me and that was, and I, I thought so too. And then I, I kind of pushed myself on this one a lot and I pulled from a lot of um, people that I admired and respected to, uh, to try to come up with like a, a style and aesthetic for this thing. And uh, it's, it's grown over time. Here's another two page spread um, from the series. I think I have the inks for this too. But this is early on in the series, and, and Wes did a great job of, of coloring it as well. Um, I was also trying to play around a bit with, with uh, the layout of my pages so that, um, that I would do things that were new and push me in, in different ways. So like for example, with this one, it's a, it's a pretty simple um, three-point perspective drawing. You can see like the, this piece here on the right um, converges all back onto one point and has, you know, we have a, another perspective line going vertically and then another one going on this axis here. But I started to do stuff that was fun where I was like pulling my actual panel uh, borders into the perspective as well, uh, which ended up being like a really fun motif that I would play with throughout the series. Um, but uh, here's, oh, I don't have that. Um, here's another page though that I wanted to show you while I'm talking. The, what you saw was the final product. This is another video, so this is, Oh, wait, I think it's another video. I hope it's another video. It should be. I guess maybe it's not. It was a video. <laughs> um, I think, oh, here it is, there we go. So, um, yeah, this is how I started working now in, in, in uh, Procreate. I, it was, prior to this, it was 15 by 20 inch um, pieces of Bristol that I would draw on and um, if I was doing a double page spread, it was, it was uh, uh, 30 by 20. But all of a sudden I was able to get really high resolution and, um, and the page sizes and, and, um, and depth that I wanted um, uh, just on my iPad. And again, if you mess something up, you can just adjust it. So a lot of my, um, my uh, setup process that I used to do, a lot of my thumbnailing and a lot of my, um, my like preliminary stages were consolidated. Normally I would do a thumbnail for a page that would take me maybe like half an hour, but um, 
with this program, these days, like I, I kind of just go on the fly a little bit more. Like I kind of know what I want to do. And, and if I need to do a close-up panel or a, or a medium shot or establishing shot, and I just go into it, and if I don't like something, um, I, just, I can just grab it and move it. So um, you'll see that some of these panels shift a little bit, just in tiny increments as I go along. And, um, and it also helped me a lot in another way, too. Um, for anyone who does any sort of drawing or, or anything like that, it's sometimes you're not always um, engaged in one part of the process. Like I'll be, I'll be penciling for a while and I'll get tired of it. Like I'll be drawing for several hours and be like, I gotta stop penciling, but I can't jump into inks yet because I gotta finish my pencils. Well, with this, I was, if I was bored or if I was struggling with a panel, I would just leave it and I would start inking like these panels you're seeing here. Um, and what's cool about this time-lapse thing is that it's, it's cutting, and here, so another thing I wanna talk about, uh, I could pull photo references into this. So you saw that I had the rough idea for a panel, but I was having a hard time landing what I wanted that angle to be and what my perspective was. So I could just grab a photo. I could, you know, that was me sitting there on, on, a, on a stool. And I will, I'll take that. I think I do it in panel two as well. You'll see that pretty soon. I'll take those photo references and I'll extract something from it that I like, you know. Um, I could even take the photo reference up there on top, uh, the one that I'm using for the buildings. That was initially not bent into that perspective, but I can pull it in there and I can manipulate and adjust it to be in my perspective if I just grab the ends of it and move it around. Um, so that allows a lot of quick uh, decision making um, and shortcuts too. And I'm at a point too, like a lot of, you'll see a lot of creators are like this. Um, if you ever get to see the behind their, their scenes, if anyone's done comics for a long time, it's like you know how to draw. You don't have to prove anything. So it's like you, you find things that work for you and you just pull from them. You're like, okay, I want to I want to have this L train over here. So I'm going to grab a photo of that and look at it and pull parts of it and maybe leave other parts out. But um, the idea with with uh, with comics um, that you're putting out on a regular basis is to get it done as fast as possible. So this allows for that uh, quite a bit. Um, this tracks probably about 10 to 12 hours of work, I think it was, and you're going to see it in the span of like a minute or so more, I think. And as you're seeing, like I'm pulling up car references and what the car was in the previous issue is, is right there in the middle right there. So it's up on a, on a different layer. And then when I'm done with it, I just throw it away. Um, but it just kept uh, developing and I kept pushing this thing without really having to do what I used to do, um, which would be to have to draw every last detail out of everything before I went into pencils. Um, so it's very helpful. So yeah, there, there's me. <laughs> um, and I think we get to the finished page. I'll show you the finished page again. So there's, there's what it ended up looking like. There's a little bit more left in the thing, but, um, but that's pretty much the gist of it. And this was the series, the first uh, full series, this fr the full story arc of, of season one of Touching Evil. And I got to issue seven and I was very nervous about you know, what to do next because I wanted to collect it, but I self-published this whole thing. So I've never, with this particular series, I've never really used a, a publisher. I've worked with publishers, uh, quite, a, quite a few of them in the past, like Devil's Due, First Comics, uh, Boom, Dynamite, um, uh, probably like, I don't know, six or seven more that are in the middle tier of, of comics. But um, usually my own projects, I kind of like to have a little bit more control over them. And um, so with this one, when I got to the end, I'm like, I want to make a collection of this. I want to make something really nice. And I've done a few Kickstarters or been a part of them before. Um, can I do one for this? Do I have the audience for it? And so I, I did some research. I, I went through a couple different um, uh, uh, printer options before I landed with uh, Kraken Print, which is a, a Chicago-based printer uh, that, that prints out. They, they outsource the printing, but they're based here. and. Um, and I said, okay, what do you think I need to raise to do this? And so they're like, well, you probably need to raise about like $11,000 to really make that book happen. Um, and I'm like, okay, let me put it at like 9,500. I was really like low balling it. I'm like, if nothing else, I'll get that and I can cover the rest and it'll be fine. Um, and so I put it at 9,500. I, I created a, a, a tier of goals and stretch goals and I did the best I can. I, I researched from, um, other Kickstarters that I thought were successful, and I talked to a lot of my, my comic friends, which um, is the other advantage of doing those conventions, by the way. You start to meet peers, 
instead of being at home with you, you and your desk and your, and your dogs. Um, so I've launched this Kickstarter in um, years, a couple years ago. And, uh, and so I, I wanted to get 9,500 and it got up to almost uh, $17,000, which was amazing. Um, and I learned a lot about that particular platform too throughout the process. I, I made a, a lot of mistakes in it, but the beauty part about um, the, the current day and age that we're living in is that it is possible to uh, pretty much self uh, fund and create um, through your fan base and through your own skill set uh, a complete and finished graphic novel. Like uh, even if you look up there on the on your wall of fame, there the God Hates Astronauts book. So that's a Chicago creator, uh, Ryan Brown. Um, it's a small circle that we all live in. Uh, he's he's a, a phenomenal talent. He wrote and drew that series, and uh, he started that one off just kind of self-publishing and self-financing, and has made quite a name for himself from that. But he he was one of the people that I, I looked to when I was um, trying to figure out how to do this, and definitely one of the people who showed how it could be done successfully. Uh, let's see. So I uh, just want to throw a couple other um, a couple other projects that I've worked on or just fun things that I've done um, before I open it up to questions or talk about process. H here's um, a two-page spread from a, a local comic that I was working on that helps uh, inner city youth. It's uh, from the Made Collaborative uh, Foundation. They do, basically what they do is they take uh, kids who are in the Chicago public school system who are in like different creative programs and they, um, they t ask them what they what they would want to write in terms of a comic. Like they pick their brains for ideas, and then they hire professional writers and artists to make it happen. So I was one of the people that got hired to do this, and um, it was a really it's a really fun story that's uh, actually coming out pretty soon. But um, it was really cool to connect with like a young imagination and just hear what they thought was was fun and awesome, and then just kind of draw that and make it happen. Um, this is the initial inks for the page. And again, this was also done in, just on my iPad. Um, let's see, do I have more of that? Oh, and here's actually the process of it, too. So there, there was the kid's sketch. <laughs> that's, what, uh, that's what the kid wanted. <laughs> um, but we talked about like panel layout, and, and the, the writer of the thing broke it down um, in ways that you know, were a little bit more professional. Um, because these kids are just, they're, I'm talking like 14 years old maybe, um, and uh, basically just trying to make all of their, their fun ideas happen. So I went from having this, this is just the guy jumping into the crowd and then like biff, bam, pow, all that stuff. And then trying to like work with that and play with um, panel layout. So again, you can see like um, using perspective to actually create the, the panels uh, the, the borders for the panels. Um, and then I even used kind of a, like a fisheye effect for the bottom panels, which I have to show you back when we go there. Um, so back down at the bottom, like bending the panels into uh, kind of a warped perspective was all made a lot more possible with, with the iPad. Um, so I'm keep going here. Go to the next one. Oh, cool. So. Uh, here's a more recent project too for another sh local um, <coughs> local comics creator group. Uh, they're called Unshaven Comics. We kind of joke that we're enemies because I'm Beardo and they're unshaven, so <laughs> there can only be one game in town for for her suit comics. Uh, but uh, <coughs> this was actually a really fun one for me because I had been working so um, so much in my iPad that I was kind of missing doing more traditional stuff. So this was all done with. Um, with ink washes and and technical pens and quills, and I I had some fun with it, and I also set some rules up for myself that I couldn't use a ruler in my actual drawings, so that they would everything would be kind of like wobbly and loose and, and a little bit more free, um, and so I drew these on um, watercolor paper with no borders, and then when I, I uh, scanned them in, I would then cut each panel out and put it into a, a border in Illustrator after cutting it up in Photoshop. Um, but doing that was kind of made it a little bit more freeform and loose because I was getting, I, f I was feeling really rigid in the, the Procreate app um, and I felt like it was time to loosen up a bit. So this is uh, eight pages from it. You just saw the, the first two. Um, it's about a Kung Fu monkey <laughs> who, uh, 
who, um, who was trying to rescue his friend from a speakeasy in the Prohibition era. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty proud of it. <laughs> I stand by it. Um, so he busts through, he comes in, he gets surrounded by a bunch of goons, and then he, he beats them all up. Um, and again, like all this was just really fun uh, technique stuff for me. Like I, I love doing some of the br uh, dry brush stuff that you get for the texture in the, in the floor. Um, I use, by the way, for anyone who's keeping score on, on the materials, uh, I use Higgins Eternal ink for my ink washes. And I use uh, black magic ink for my uh, my darker inks, like my, my finishes, like line work and such. Um, and I think I just did this on some pretty basic watercolor paper that you could get at Michael's. But um, it's really all I needed because I just need something that could work with like wet materials. Um, and then here he is beating up more people. And then um, finding out that the monkey actually liked being there <laughs> and drinking. Um, but uh, yeah, this was a really fun exercise. And actually, this was the last thing I did before my kid was born. Um, and this is the part that I wanted to get to. Like, this is the last bit. <laughs> this is my life right now. <laughs> Plus one more kid. There's another, there's a new kid. So my daughter is two, and she, uh, she is awesome, but she is a handful. Um, she is definitely wild. And, uh, and I love her to death, but she, she was kind of the focus of the, the, the fifth and what ended up being final book of, of Beardo. Um, so I realized as I was getting further along in the Beardo series and, and in my career that something kind of had to give. Um, and I've been getting a lot of really exciting opportunities to work on other things and these other projects I wanted to work on. So Beardo, I felt like hit the 10 year mark. I had five books, I'm like, I feel pretty good about it. And I'm just gonna make this, uh, this last book and, and peace out. So um, I felt like I had a really good ending for it too, which um, I'll get to in a second. But the subject of the book for this one was, um, was parenting mostly, was being a new dad and all the, the crazy stuff about you know, having a toddler and, and adjusting your life to that. So um, it was actually very easy to write because that kid is not lacking for material. Like she is constantly finding ways to be funny or a pain or sometimes both. And, um, and so I was doing all these strips and I was actually starting to realize like, man, I think people are really relating to this one the most because there's a lot of young parents out there and, or at least people who've been through parenting and know it. Um, or on the flip side can start, you know, being old enough to like, you know, think about their, their parents' experience. So um, this book ended up being um, kind of cool because it was probably the most successful one of the bunch. So it was nice to know that it, towards the back end of it that I still had some legs um, this is my, my Procreate video from coloring it. Now with Beardo, I always made a point of uh, still drawing it by hand on paper. So all my um, ink work was very simple. It was just uh, technical pens on very basic paper. I would scan it in and then um, clean it up and, um, and color it in, in the Procreate app. So um, my colors are also very simple too. It's one of the few, uh, the few comics that I also color myself and I always keep a pretty limited palette. Um, I keep my colors flat for the most part. There's very little gradients in them. And um, my palette tends to be more on the, the bright to muted side. Um, but I keep my layers simple too. Um, my layers are typically just a foreground layer for my characters and a background layer or two for my, my background and any, any of the things that pop up. Like if there's like an effect or a, a thing that I wanna do that might earn its own layer, but usually my my file size on these beardos is small because it might be like five or six layers tops. Like that's the most it would be. Um, so you can see the, the final effect of that strip right there. Um, here is another one, really simple. Um, just kind of talk, I was trying to keep it simple on, on the, the, the parenting ones. Like I was trying to cut down the amount of words I was using. I was just cutting to the core of things. Um, so this one was just about the scary part about in the middle of the night when your your kid is very still, <laughs> almost too still, and you have to go over there and make sure that they're breathing. And they are, of course, but it's that, that little fear that creeps up in the middle of the night, and then you go like, okay, kid's cool, we're fine. Um, that one resonated with a lot of people. Uh, and then there's this one. This is the one that got away from me. Uh, I, I went viral, guys, um, and I really didn't expect, this is the end of Beer. This is uh, the last two pages of the book which oddly enough, I mean, I put out last, 
was it last summer, I think it was, or last something. It was, it was last year I put the thing out, but I was pacing out the strips online so that it actually ended online um, in August, I think it was. So very recently, I, I had a Sunday, and I'm like, okay, today's my last day. I'm posting the final Beardo. It's going to be over. And then, um, and then I did this. So there's this page. It's a two-page strip. This is probably one of the longer ones I've done. So it's, it's following me through my whole kid's life. And then um, all this stuff, it gets a little tear-jerkery. Um, so basically, it gets all the way up to the point where you know, I'm an old man, and my kid's grown up, and then um, surprises me with a, a, a grandchild of, uh, um, of whatever. I didn't even say if it's a boy or girl. And then realizing that like time is moving just really fast, which was probably the most true sentiment of the whole book for me. Like I, I, When I did this strip, it wasn't meant to be the last one. But when I finished it, I was like, I don't know what else I can say after this. Like This pretty much summed it up for me. Um, and uh, so I posted it. and. I really didn't think anything of it. Like I, I, I had a little fan base on, on Facebook that I knew I had, and I, I had um, a nice fan base on Go Comics. But I've always had like Spartan fans. Like there's not a lot of them, but they're rabid. Like they, they always back me up, and they always pledge to things. And so I, yeah, my, I call them my Beardo Brigade. And um, I've been really lucky to have that. But I, I'm not the kind of person who's like crazy big. I'm just kind of you know uh, pretty much even keel. So I was very surprised after I posted this that um, it went really viral. So some of the statistics of it, like it, it got on the Huffington Post, is probably the biggest part of it. Um, when all this stuff happened, um, it, it first blew up on Facebook, and I hit like 6.5 million people in a, a couple days, I think it was, um, just by watching how it shared. Too. It was very interesting to watch how the algorithm was just trying to keep up with it and, uh, and all the, the data that they give you on a page. Um, but I was starting to get like people messaging me about this, like not just not my friends and everything, but like um, people from other countries asking to translate it. Um, the uh, uh, Board Panda, uh, Reddit, like a bunch of different places that started popping up independently of me. And so I realized that as amazing as this was, I'd also made a very crucial mistake. I had, n I had put none of my information on the strip on the actual visual. So I had to like fix that really fast. Um, and I also had to like um, get ahead of it. And people were asking about prints. So I started making prints of the thing. And it's become my most popular thing I've ever done. Uh, and I couldn't quantify it. I couldn't tell you how to repeat that success. I have no idea why that was the one that blew up. But it did. So it was, it was really cool. It was, it, you know, after doing something for 10 years and having a strip that um, has had its highs and lows and through a, uh, probably one of the worst times for comic strips in terms of the newspaper world, um, to find that at the end was like a nice validating kind of uh, feeling. So this has been my, my little motto strip that I, I post on my, my web page to let people know a little bit about me. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's kind of how I feel about a lot of things. I, I will say that uh, I am not somebody who's done things by themselves. I, I am very lucky to have uh, some good friends. And of course, like my wife is, is very supportive and has been really awesome with everything that I've done. Um, but a lot of the things that I've been endeavoring to do, you know, I had to work my way up and do them on my own. Um, and so I like, I like that I'm a self-made mess, basically. That's kind of my, my, my motto. Um, and uh, I know we have a little bit of time left. We have until like, what, 10.45? So can I open it up to questions? Does anyone have any questions at this point? Yeah. I was just curious um, when you illustrate for other authors, exactly how much input did they give you and what they did with it? So just be curious. Like, That's a good question. Like, so specifically on the characters or just their vision in general? Um, it can be a mixed bag with that one. I mean, honestly, um, and I've worked with several different writers, uh, and each one of them is a little different. Uh, typically, the biggest thing that that works, or the thing that works the best, is when they have a good sense of roughly what they want, and usually it involves telling you 
references that you can relate to in pop culture, right? So they'll say like, if they want this character to look um, like a like a slim, uh, slick haired guy, they'd be like, think like Keanu Reeves in Devil's Advocate, and then but you like, but don't draw Keanu Reeves in Devil's Advocate, right? So they'll, typically, a lot of people will say like something that you can relate to to start with, but they want to see what you can do, um, and writers. I mean, I, to me, a good writer-artist collaboration is a give and take. Like, I think that um, they should have some input on it. They should have a lot of input on it, but they should also be willing to, um, to work with the artist. And they probably should have hired the artist that they think could have done what they wanted anyway. Ideally, that's what you want. You don't want to get a guy who's really cartoony and then ask him to do photorealistic stuff. Um, so usually when somebody picked me up, they'd be like, I remember what you did in this one book. I like that. So can we use that as a starting point and then build from there? And, and that helps a lot. Um, I have had a few people who said, I don't care what you do, just draw. But usually, I don't know, something about that actually isn't as fun. Like I kind of like, I'm, I'm, when I come to work with a, with a collaborator, um, you know, obviously there's money as a factor of it too, but sometimes it's just because I'm sick of hearing my own opinion. Like I am so tired of my own voice or my own, uh, perspective that I really want to hear theirs. So um, the fun ones are the ones that it's a give and take. Yeah. Um, you had a question back there. On average, yeah. On average, how much time would you say you dedicate to a spread from start to finish? Like one of the two page spreads that I was doing? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it depends on how detailed it is, but I would say a spread would take me about three days because a good a good comic page is about a day to a day and a half for me, and so a spread would be twice that. Um, sometimes it actually, in a way, is simplified because a lot of times it's a singular image or a large centerpiece image with surrounding panels, and that, in a way, can... Um, alleviate some of the concerns of having to approach two different pages instead of one. But I'd say a, a fair estimate would be about two to three days around there. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So, uh, so when speaking to a lot of uh, artists, they'll say that they experience a high that helps them to write or draw, and then they say the biggest obstacle is getting that high uh, to go draw or write. So do you need that high, and what do you do, and how do you keep <laughs> it? Yeah, that's okay, so do I need that high, what do I do, and how do I keep it? And by high, you mean kind of like that, that like kind of hitting your creative rhythm and... Right, like a mode. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do think that there's times where I'm definitely more like in the zone than others, like where I feel almost like I'm on autopilot because, um, because I'm, I've reached whatever, like I've, I've gotten past my problems and now I'm in the, the fun part. Um, yeah, I, we're really talking about writer's block here in a sense, There's, and that's a, a big thing. Um, I've been pretty fortunate um, that any time that I felt like I was struggling with something, I had something else to work on. And I found that that's been a really uh, key component to um, keeping myself creatively up is to be able to walk away when I'm stuck and jump into something else. Um, and that's worked for me a lot. Like I, I, you know, because I've, in my career, I've got a lot of books. Like I've had a lot of things to, to occupy myself if I was stuck on Beardo. Sometimes I, would, I wouldn't draw Beardo for like a month because I had, I'm like, I'm tanked in that. Like I got nothing right now. And nothing was happening. Like I, would, I wasn't getting anything funny in my life or interesting in my life. Like life was not always interesting. Sometimes it's very boring, you know? So I would go, okay, well, what else do I have to work on? And I would jump to that, and um, I would find that, you know, your mind, I think, almost works better when you're not trying so hard. You know, like, I mean, it's true, like, the thing that people say about best ideas come, like, when you're in the shower or driving in the car or my thing is those two, but also running. I go running, and by the time I'm done with, like, a five-mile run, I've got, like, four new ideas or I've figured out a problem because I don't think about it so much. And that's, I've learned that that's like part of, part of it, like part of the creative process. So for me, it's running, actually. Um, was there a third part I missed? Did I catch all? Yes. How do I keep it? Yeah. 
So I think keeping it really is, is about, um, um, like I said, having more than one thing to focus on. Like I, I'm not a great multitasker, but I'm a pretty good multitasker, and I, I, like, I like the freedom in comics that like, um, when, my own th when I want to work on my own things, I can, I can do that. So, you know, some, I, find, I carve out time in the day for that, and then I have my jobs that I do, like freelance, that um, I can go much more easily into autopilot because it's someone else's vision that I'm interpreting, right? So that helps a lot. Yeah, but I mean, staying active is the best part. I think the worst part about writer's block is when people think that they just have to wait for something to happen. You kind of have to just get messy and, and make, I mean, I, for every book that I have, I've probably got an equal amount of paper that is just failures and garbage, like things that went wrong or um, the joke didn't land or, um, you know, the story didn't take the right turn, blah, blah, blah. And you kind of have to accept that as a, a, a part of the process, you know. Um, other questions or anything? Are we, are we good? Um, I can show you really quick one last thing, um, the app that I was talking about. So it's uh, right here in the bottom left, where's my app? Um, you can see all these, uh, all these things that I've worked on, a bunch of different stuff, but it's really simple. Um, you just, you can create a new document, and let's make one that's really simple, like eight inches by 10. You can cr set your DPI, which is pretty crucial for um, print and for just quality in general. Print quality is usually no less than 300, but like I like to set stuff at like six to 900, depending on how, how dense I want it to be. Um, your your trade-off with that, of course, um, in this, in this program at least, is that the higher your file size, the smaller your layers you'll get. So if you want a lot of layers, you, you have to find that, that happy ground, basically, a middle ground of, I've got the layers I need to work with, and I also have the resolution that I need and the size. So once you get that, um, I don't know if I have my pencil on me, but, oh, it's in my bag. Um, so once you get your file, basically, um, it's really set up to be very user friendly. You have brushes, there's a ton of them. There's painting, artistic, airbrushing, textures, uh, abstract, charcoals, I mean it goes on and on and on. And the interesting thing too about this is that this, all these settings apply to um, three different things. Your brushes, your erasers have the exact same settings. So you can also kind of work in the negative with the same um, brush or pen stroke. So. I mean, you could also do that another way by just, you know, changing your, your drawing brush or pen to white. But the brush is, the, the eraser part is pretty helpful. Um, with all of these, and this is the smudge tool, by the way. I don't use that so much, but it also has the same settings for everything. Um, with all of these, you have, and I think it had to charge this to do this. So I actually can't use my pencil right now. But you can um, draw and erase very simple. If you want to go back, you just double tap with your uh, with two fingers. Um, you have on the on the left here the size of your brush. So from there to there. Uh, the opacity of your brush is down here. So this is complete opacity. This is like what 20% let's say. Um, your layers, I can keep adding layers. I can go inside of a layer and reduce its opacity. So I could take like that whole layer of my, my lines that I had here and bring it down a bit, bring it up. Um, you can multiply layers, meaning that they can be transparent. Um, you can insert images. So if I wanted to paste from my clipboard of whatever I had, so here's a flute that I drew. <laughs> um, apparently that was the last thing I had in my clipboard. Um, uh, you can insert flat images and you can just pull from your photo library. So anything that you have here, you can go for it. Um, your perspective guide. This is actually the coolest part of this whole thing. I got to show you this, if nothing else. So I teach it. By the way, I didn't even tell you this. I teach at a school called the International School of Comics. It's uh, it's downtown. It's specifically for comics and illustration. Um, but one of the big things that we always have a hard time with are from the new students to the the year three students is perspective. Um, so you can have a guide set up for perspective that you can then edit. So if I needed to create a point, I've got a vanishing point. And now I've got two point perspective. And now I've got a three point perspective. 
And so once you get all that and you set it wherever you want it, let's say I set it here, I can go into my layer and there's an assist thing right there. If you hit that, any line I draw is now in perspective. And I'm, I, I'm moving my finger all over the place. I'm not staying straight at all. Like, it doesn't matter how I draw it. It's going to stay in the perspective of the grid that I set up. And if I ever want to change the grid, I just can go back into the edit mode for the perspective and move that. It's not going to move the line work, but it will move the points. So you can set up to three point perspective, which is pretty much all you need to create any environment. Um, and I used to have to do that by taking my giant piece of paper and a yardstick and my points were frequently off the page. So I'd have to set up little pieces of paper on my drawing board that had the points and I'd be pulling the ruler and smudging my pencils as I pulled the ruler. So I'd have to be careful not to do that. And so all that stuff, though very handy and I love doing, is a lot harder to do than just to come in here and do this. So if you've learned nothing else from today, perspective grid. <laughs> um, and uh, you can grab stuff with it. This is pretty easy. I can grab a selection and I can shrink it or change it or move it. Frequently something that I do when I'm setting up my pages. So if I think a panel is well drawn, but it's in the wrong spot, maybe I need to shift it. I just grab the pencils and I move it over a little bit and I'm good to go. Um, whereas in the past I'd have to like either redraw it or cut and paste that later in Photoshop if I, if I felt like it needed to move. There's a, I could talk all day about this thing, but if you have an iPad and you have $6, it is worth it. You want to kind of mess around with stuff. You get a color wheel, by the way, and swatches. You can set your own swatches. So really, it's, it's very excellent. And then the beauty part is that when you're done with something, I can share the artwork. I can export the video like I showed you. Um, but I can share the artwork as a Photoshop document, a PDF, a JPEG, a Procreate document, or a PNG. And um, I usually just airdrop it over to my Mac and do any touch-up work that I need, I need to do over there. Um, and it's all very simple. So uh, for anyone who's uh, an art person and sort of a computer geek, you're going to love that. Um, I just, it seems like you are. <laughs> Not to single someone out, but it seems like you were like, yes. Yes, uh, that's the one, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really cool program. And again, I could talk all day about it. Um, did anyone else have any other questions? Because that's think, all I got. Yeah, I think, I think we're about out of time. So yeah. how about a round of applause for Dan? Cool, thank you. I hope that uh, you take a moment to go out, check out his work outside, buy a book, um, have him sign it. Today at 1230, we are playing uh, board games in the coffee bar. So please join us. There's a talk about Dungeons and Dragons, and we're playing. so. It will be fun. Thank you all for coming. That's cool.